Good morning, everyone. I want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Drs. Uh, Peter Stevick and Sean Todd, um, on this paper um, about harp seal and hooded seal trend, trends of abundance in the northern Gulf of Maine. Introduction, uh, just to give you a little background about these cast of characters, I, I know most of you here work with harp and hooded seals, but for some of you who do not or do not know um, a little bit about harps and hoods, uh, just to give you uh, basic background, um, harp seals, um, and I've got my notes here too, harp seals are known as uh, pagophilic or ice loving, uh, also ice breeding seals um, that have a penchant for utilizing the pack ice on which to produce their pups, and also on which to rest. And there are three recognized uh, breeding populations of harps. Um, we have off the White Sea off the northwestern uh, part of Russia, also off uh, Jan Mayen north of Iceland, and uh, the harps off the western North Atlantic. Uh, the latter stock are the ones that we'll be talking about here. So harps are found um, up in the Arctic in summer, they feed on Arctic cod, krill, herring, uh, and uh, capelin and herring. Um, in the winter, they migrate south, and they're found off the western North Atlantic, um, off Newfoundland, uh, known as the Front, and also in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And here they give birth to their pups. Uh, harp seal pups are born between February and March, um, typically, as I said, on the Front or in the Gulf. In their first few weeks of life, um, they go from being the white coats, then the what are known as ragged jackets as they're molting, getting rid of that lanugo. And uh, then they get to the beater stage, which they remain at for about 14 months. And, and this is the one that we've been seeing a lot more down here. And when they're about uh, four years of age, sexually mature, they get the characteristic saddleback or harp on the back and the darker brown face. Hooded seals, um, also pagophilic or ice-loving animals, ice-breeding seals, um, likewise found up in the Arctic. Um, they do breed off the front and also um, in the, uh, the Gulf as well. Although off the front, they tend to be a little bit more offshore on sort of heavier drifting pack ice, so a little bit away from, from the harp seals. Interesting thing about the hooded seal is uh, um, known as bluebacks when they're born. Um, they have the shortest uh, nursing period of any mammal in the world. It's only four days. And uh, they maintain that uh, blueback pelage till about 14 months, eventually losing it to get uh, the sort of splotched look. Um, and with the males having the, call it an inflated nose sack, if you will, um, or the hood for which they're named. Um, so females reach sexual maturity at around age three, and the males at around age five. Okay, back in the uh, 90s, uh, this is a lot of work of Don McAlpine in New Brunswick. He worked with uh, one of my co-authors, Peter Stevick, um, looking at this dramatic increase or in reports of harp and hooded seals. Prior to the 1900s, really, we had very few. And it's a very dramatic uh, table here that shows uh, decades on the x-axis going back to 1840, when there were very few uh, cell phones back then. Uh, on the y-axis, you have number of seals that were reported. Um, I don't know if you can make out the uh, turquoise or the hooded seals and harps in the uh, maroon. Uh, so back, I think the earliest one you see is back in like the 1870s. There was one report of a hooded seal and, and so on. So very few reports. Now granted, we, communication is a whole lot better now. And, uh, uh, but still, when you hit the 1900s and you have this dramatic shift, it's like someone turned the switch on and here they are. So um, from that work, uh, we, we wanted to see if uh, things had changed, have harped and hooded seal numbers increased, decreased, leveled off, just what was happening. So it was kind of fun to work uh, uh, through this data uh, with Peter and Sean. Um, just to show you some images um, of some of these early sightings, because as my colleagues uh, uh, told me back then in the 80s, when they got a report in wintertime of a seal, they'd all go out from Ally Will to go see what it was. Uh, because they just did not get any seals here in winter. 
at least none that were really reported to us. So here's a, an example of one of the earliest, um, is a harp seal beater back in the 1980s, and that's uh, Bob Bowman, for those of you who know who Bob, he's with that uh, uh, <laughs> video camera. Uh, they didn't know what this was when they went out to it, and uh, I believe Steve Katona went, and Tom, and Peter, and Bob Bowman, and they collected this animal, put it in the back of the pickup truck, which Tom was telling me about, and uh, it had gone catatonic on them, and then it, <laughs> it came out of that state, and I think Tom had to kind of jump out of there. But they took it down to the COA pier and just, just let it go. And I mean, they realized what it was, but it, it took a little figuring out. So this, this was new. And it was funny for me coming down from Canada and uh, hearing about this, because at that time, I was just coming into the time, 94, 95, when they were starting to get harp seals here and hooded's with greater numbers. And uh, so to hear that prior to that time, it was just unusual to ever even get a call in wintertime. So uh, this was probably one of the first harp seals uh, that we had, that, that we had reports of in our area. Um, for those of you who know Dave Morin and Stephanie Martin, early photo, along with me on the far right, and uh, blue back uh, just on the south side of Mount Desert Island that's in Southwest Harbor. I remember going out to that uh, back then. This hooded seal, Tom will remember well. Uh, it was, uh, and, and Linda, this would have been yours <laughs> back then. Uh, this is down in Tenants Harbor, not typically our turf right now, uh, but we had a report of this adult male hooded seal uh, that our crew went down to, and it was a quarter mile inland and uh, uh, appeared kind of out of habitat, or although as my colleague Gary Stenson with DFO Canada said, Rosie, it wasn't out of a habitat. It says, I'm big and I can go where I want. Um, in fact, it did. Uh, they did herd it back to the water, and, um, and that was that. But uh, that was quite an episode and a great photo as well. Uh, we were talking about having harp seal pups here. Um, this was photographed on Mount Desert Island, winter 95. Um, it's, uh, sorry for the photo, it is uh, grainy, but it was identified. It was a, a mum uh, adult harp seal with, with a pup, uh, but that's very rare. So methods, what we did was uh, take our records from, um, let me get my spot, from 1994 uh, to 2009, we collect reports, not just strandings, so it's not just level A data, it's also sighting data that we have of both harps and hoods that are kept by the uh, Marine Mammal Stranding Response Program here at College of the Atlantic. Um, the study used um, all of those, I said, sighting and stranding data and refers to the area ranging from mid-coast Maine up to the Canadian border, just to show you that. Uh, in the uh, red box, uh, coastally anyway, is our response area, which uh, with that whole indented coastline, if you could stretch it out and add every single of the thousands of islands that we have, would translate to a good 2,600 miles. So it, it is extensive and often remote coastline uh, and very tidally energized as well, because remember right near the Bay of Fundy with some very large tides that we have to deal with. Um, and as well, sometimes we'll get uh, seals that go upstream to Bangor, for example. Uh, interestingly, we're also asked at times to, uh, I get calls from New Brunswick, which is interesting as a Canadian that I have to say, ironically, you're not in my turf, um, so I have to refer them to DFO. Um, so sometimes we are in a unique situation in that uh, we sometimes have an international situation. So we have that northern half and Linda's half uh, to the south, to the New Hampshire border. Okay, for each stranding or sighting, record seals were identified to species by experienced personnel visiting the site and or photographs of, uh, of the species. And having, I have to say, with the advent of digital cameras has, has really helped a whole lot um, and email, getting photos from people. Um, so we, did, uh, we took records of harp seals, hooded seals, and those for which the species could not be determined are included in these analyses. Live and dead animals in all age classes are included. And for this study, we examined records of species confirmed indi individuals, as I said, from 1994 to 2009, um, as well as records where, where we say the species are unknown. It's due to inexperience uh, or that we didn't have photos that they, or that they were too decomposed to identify. 
uh, reports are pooled by the peak stranding season. So we went from, we created a season that was December through to March of that year, because it didn't make sense to take the December from the following year. So a season was, for example, December 2008, January 1st, March of 2009. Uh, that, the data were tabulated, and we did regressions on the abundance of harp seals by year, hooded seals by year, and on unknowns as well. OK, got a few uh, figures for you here. Uh, for harp seals, um, we did uh, a regression, and uh, the figure shows here uh, the number of harp seal reports, and once again, both alive and dead, sightings and strandings. Uh, we have year on the uh, x-axis and number of animals or number of reported animals on the y-axis. So we performed that regression and did find a significant increase in harp seals for this time period. Interestingly, three of the seasons, including, as you can see, 1998, 1999, and 2003, had substantially fewer seals that were seen in the other years. Uh, of interest, each of the low years, you can see it's like a little pulse. It, it uh, is followed by a year of increase, um, as if what we're seeing here is an ever-increasing series of pulses. This may be linked to changes in ice conditions per year, but we're not sure. Um, that lovely pink line that you see uh, is the beginning or advent of the Prescott uh, Stranding Grants uh, that began basically for us in 2003. One of the first concerns when we saw this data, especially just after uh, the Prescott Grants, was that perhaps what we were looking at was a reporting effect, a uh, result of better training, better coverage, because now we offer, uh, you know, we do ice seal and also spring training uh, for volunteers uh, within our region. So it, you know, is it just a matter of better training and coverage? However, we know the trend started before our funding, and we will present data later on that further supports the idea that in fact this is not likely a reporting effect. I also want to point out um, what appears to be a new trend, um, and that's the increase in the presence of adult um, harp seals. Um, we rarely got adults. We, we would get the beater class or the juvenile age class, uh, but uh, a couple of years ago we got, a, we got, you see, last year we had three, and Linda, you had eight, I think, in southern Maine, and this year we just had two sightings, but Linda had 16 live, and she hasn't even counted the dead adults. So we're seeing this dramatic, you know, apparently dramatic shift in, um, or increase in adults. And I just want to point out, <laughs> this, this animal uh, was from 2009. It came up the Penobscot River all the way up to Bangor, and we got a call from uh, Eastern Maine Medical Center, uh, and it was right out in front on the ice, and they were a bit concerned because it did have an injury. Uh, I couldn't get to it because it was in, on the ice. It had some open water, as you can see there. Uh, but I had this whole medical staff watching it, and uh, it appeared to do very well. Uh, and uh, they got all these photos from me, and, and they kept me updated. And uh, as you see, it's a, it's a quite plump a harp seal. And uh, that, that breathing hole there, they, they called that the uh, seal jacuzzi because they had it in and out of the water quite a bit. So. All right, hooded seals. This figure represents um, the picture for hoodeds. Once again, we have on the x-axis a uh, year from 94 to 2009, and on the y-axis, the number of hooded seal uh, reports. Um, as you can see, there is no significant trend and a very low R squared. So even though the best fit line that you see there, that's that green line, uh, has a slightly negative slope. The, st the statistics won't let us say that uh, hooded seals are increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. However, these da data do support the idea that the trend seen in the previous slide is not a reporting effect. And in general, we see less hooded seals than harp seals. And I know a number of you who work with both have experienced that, that the hooded seals are really scattered in, in uh, time and space. And in fact, we get hooded seals um, any time of the year. I remember one. Uh, summer in July, we got reports. We had six hooded seals in like a week, and then bang, they were gone. So they, they seem to sort of come in pulses, and then they're gone. 
Results for unknowns, once again, unknown seals that we didn't get photos of and then they were gone before we could get there. Maybe it was a carcass that was too decomposed to identify the species, um, and so on. Um, once again, we have a figure showing year on the x-axis and number of reports on the y-axis. Um, we had a similar non-significant decreasing trend, uh, although we did have a stronger R-squared. So if this trend is real, it may be because our first uh, response network uh, is getting better at identifying species. Remember I mentioned the advent of the Prescott Grant, being able to do more training, uh, getting photos of animals, people better know how to do that, and being able to identify. So it may be simply that also that while our unknowns are going down, it's more a method methodological change rather than a biological one. And uh, so we're, we are saying that, again, this data supports the idea that the increase of harps is not a reporting factor. And also, uh, I don't have data here to show this, but for gray seals, I looked at that the other day, and that's just basically stayed the same. So uh, again, showing that it's, it's likely not a reporting effect uh, for harp seals. Okay. Um, this histogram uh, shows the number of harps and hoods, um, sightings and strandings, once again, from uh, 1994, 2009. On the x-axis, we have year from 94, once again up to 2009, and number of animals on the y-axis. The hooded seals are represented in the green bars and the yellow bars are the hooded seals. Sorry, uh, yellow for harps, hooded are green. And uh, we did a correlation on this data to see if harp and hooded seal presence uh, was, uh, was correlated. And we found that it was not so, the R being negative uh, 0.087. And as I noted in an earlier slide, hooded seal presence certainly is variable and scattered, so this is probably not unusual. So in summary, um, harp seals are continuing to increase um, and effectively are, as we say, they're really now part of the winter fauna here in Maine, certainly in, in northern Maine, and uh, we're seeing further to the south and talking to our colleagues in uh, Massachusetts and New York and even further afield to the south that uh, um, harps certainly are making their presence felt. Um, and especially beaters, but now that we're getting more uh, in the uh, uh, adult age class as well. And I was interested in hearing um, the uh, state report yesterday from Lanny. Uh, it was interesting when she did the tally of seals. And for second place, I mean, it was harbor seals were number one at about 243. I can't remember the exact figure. But in second place, it wasn't gray seals, it were harp seals. So they certainly are here. And once again, as I mentioned, adult uh, harps, which is interesting because I sort of wonder what's the ramifications for rehab with these, you know, we're used to having beaters and smaller animals, but now we're getting these larger, um, the adult uh, harps. Just something to think about. Uh, hooded seals, uh, trends in hoodeds, less clear. Uh, they're more variable, as I said, scattered from year to year. Um, I mentioned that time we had a pulse of them in summertime, so I, I'm never really sure when I'm going to see a hooded seal. So they're less seasonal than the harp seals are. Um, interesting about the historic record, because um, you might think, well, maybe they used to always be down here, and they're just coming back. Their numbers have increased. We know from uh, DFO that uh, doing, for example, some of the harp seal surveys, that uh, they're really quite abundant uh, at, at the Newfoundland. Uh, from work that McAlpine did, and I have these uh, references at the end, so the historic record does not suggest that either species was ever present in the area in large numbers. Um, he does cite, I, I love this, uh, a piece by Dennis written in 1672, 1672, in which he describes an active fishery for gray seals and walrus in the northern Gulf of Maine. Um, there are no mention of harps and hoods, just walrus. I'm waiting for walrus to come back here. And gray seals. They'll love that down in rehab. So prehistorically speaking, and I love history and archaeology, so this was kind of cool. Prehistorically speaking, however, uh, there have been some harp seal remains discovered uh, in some archaeological middens. They're like garbage dumps, a midden, just a fancy name for it. And uh, they did find a lot of seal remains, but 
some harp seal, so not abundant, but still enough to say, well, maybe they were down here, maybe as vagrants. I always love that term that we use for those that sort of come and drift through here. Um, so it's, it is unknown whether the uh, distribution uh, shift is due to an increase in ice seal populations or ecological factors such as changes in prey or changes in distribution due to climate change. It is curious as to why these uh, pagophilic seals are ice loving. Why do you come south where there's more likely to be less ice? Um, so that's interesting. Uh, also, have other things to think about include collapsed fish stocks. Um, we had the collapse of the uh, cod fishery in Newfoundland. I remember being up there when they took the nets out of the water. Uh, that was in the early 90s. Um, animals looking further afield for food. And uh, Dave Sargent, a fellow Montrealer, did a paper in 73 uh, that pointed out that adults will force juveniles to poor feeding areas. Maybe they thought down here was a poor feeding area, but as you saw that adults harp seal up in Bangor, it looked like it was doing quite well. Interannual variations may be, once again, changes in ice composition and extent affecting pup production, uh, changes in food availability or weather conditions. Those are some of the references, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Anne McGee, Dale Mc uh, Gail McCullough, Dave Garcelon, and Susan Garland for the use of uh, their wonderful harp seal images, including this little fellow hanging onto his ice pan. Uh, Gordon Longsworth at COA, who did the uh, GIS, uh, in our G GIS lab, who did the production of the map. Um, maps from the uh, Guide to Marine Mammals of the World, I shamelessly pilfered, uh, to show you the distribution of harps and hoods. And I want to uh, graciously acknowledge the John H. Prescott Marine Mammal Rescue Assistance Program, which has enhanced and strengthened our stranding program, as John Lean would say, immeasurably. And finally, I wish to thank our absolutely wonderful stranding uh, response volunteers here in Downey's Maine. Uh, thank you.